Eight o'clock. <laughs> Game at eight o'clock. Okay. All right, let's get started. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to General Council for March 12th, 2024. Demarcation of any media? I don't see any. Um, adoption of the agenda? Is there deletions to the agenda? If not, can I have a mover? Moved by Melba, second by Elena. All in favor? Anybody opposed? See none carried. Number five, um, delegations. We have today Grand River Employment and Training. Welcome. Thank you. Calvary yep. for Brooke. Well, first off, good evening. And on behalf of the Gretty Board and staff, I would like to thank you for extending the invitation to come and present tonight. So what I'm going to go over is just a little bit of history of Grand River Employment and Training, Inc., especially with the orientation of new council members. So I'll start off with our story. So Gretty was established in 1992. Uh, it's a community-based nonprofit organization. We're registered charity that has been recognized by Six Nations of the Grand River Community, Six Nations Elected Council, and the Confederacy Council. The Gretty Board of Directors, who operate under the policy governance model, is one of the board members, and we have one board member that's a representative of Six Nations Elected Council. The Gretty Board envisions a future where the Ongohoe of Six Nations of the Grand River Territory will have strong economies, capacity to become self-reliant, and responsibility for our well-being. The mega end statements have been worded to express the extended results of Gretty's existence. If you could hit next, sorry. And next again. So Gretty has established several social enterprises to help support its mandate. And these divisions include GREAT, which is your service delivery and administration of employment and training programs. We have Gretty Properties, which is our office leasing and our rentals. We have Gretty Financial Services, Guyana Say, which is our ecological restoration and native seed, and the Uncle Hawaii Skills and Trades Training Center, OSTTC, along with our Longhouse Project. So I'll start off with GREAT. So GREAT is recognized as the Indigenous Skills and Employment Agreement Holder for Employment and Training Services to Uncle Hawaii people regardless of residency and for any Ontarian looking for work or employers across Ontario. Program and services are at the center of GREAT and servicing clients is the reason why GREAT exists. Finance and administration are support me measures to, to the programs and service staff to ensure clients receive efficient client-centric service. The program and services policy and procedures manual flows from the board's end statement, and it's the three pillars. So it's partnership development, demand-driven skills, and accountability for improved results. Next. So the funding we currently receive is we have a 10-year agreement with ISETS and it renews in 2029. Total budget is just over $6 million. We have Indigenous Services Canada, which is an annual agreement. For 23-24, our summer work experience, it totaled $67,000. And for our skills link total, it was $183,000. Now, these programs here where you see great do all the summer student office, through the summer through our post-secondary and secondary programming. Some of the programming we have available through our ISETs would be things like training on the job, purchase of training, employment supports, we can do internships, monthly training supplements, and then our stomach, summer youth for placements. Next, please. In regards to our results, so clients served, and these are full interventions, which would mean that there's actual funding tied to it, whether it be a TOJ or a purchase of training. So for this uh, area, we were able to service just over 1,500 clients. For clients employed, GREAT was able to assist over 1,000 clients with employment, and then clients returning to school, GREAT was able to assist with 278 of our clients with return to school. 
If you look at our actual annual report, there's a lot of different interventions at the end of our report when you go through it of actual client and community members we were able to serve. So we do things like we help you get a social security or so a SIN number. We can help you with birth certificates. So we were able to service over 18,000 community members with some sort of service, but it may not have been like a full intervention for employment. It could be resume workshops and different things like that. And this is our third year in a row of us exceeding our targets through our ISET agreement. When we look next, please, it would be Six Nations Elected Council Agreements. So I was able to pull some data. So how we've been able to assist through the different departments through council is in 2021, we were able to do nine total contracts. So this would be working with different divisions like public works, health, lands and resources. So a total amount of $410,000 was spent within those departments, whether it was hiring. In 21-22, we had a total of 24 contracts for 594 and 22, 23, 28 contracts. And then 23, 24, a total of 22 contracts. So this is how GREAT has been able to assist within the different departments of council. Next, I'm gonna move on to one another one of GREATI's divisions, which would be our training school. So the Ongwahome Skills and Trades Training Center opened its doors in 2003. This is a division under Gretti, and we were established to meet the training needs of the community. So OSTTC is a member of the Indigenous Institutes Consortium, made up of seven IIs in Ontario, and we're also included under the Ontario Indigenous Institution Act. We are Indigenous owned and operated. We focus on local, accessible, and culturally appropriate programming. And as an Indigenous Institute, we provide culturally responsive and a safe learning environments grounded in Indigenous ways of knowing and living that honor our traditions. We look at meeting the needs of the community. So our education and training is a unique, um, we offer this type of training to a body of students who would often face various types of barriers. And we work hard to remove those barriers. So a lot of our clientele are those that wouldn't have access into post-secondary training coming out of high school. Um, and what we do is we work with them to look at some skills and knowledge and what they need to do to pursue the level positions and in the workplace to transition them into higher education. We carry out our operations from three Six Nations locations. So out of the Great Opportunity Center, which hosts like our metal fabricating, welding, our classrooms, we have our multi-trades building. So that's at 1039 Cheesewood Road, um, which we're offering things like plumbing, electrical, and carpentry. And then we have Guyana Say, which is our greenhouse. We have a cook station, yurts, turtle garden, and our longhouse, which we're gonna be putting under the rebuild construction happening hopefully this year. Um, and then throughout that, we look at the different training programs that we have to offer. So we do things like lifelong learning. So it's all your academic assessments and academic upgrading. One of the things that was published through Ontario now is as of May, 2024, we will no longer be running in Canada, the GED program, which I've let our board know is gonna have a huge impact in our community because a lot of our members access GED for grade 12. So we are working with the ministry. They have piloted a new project or it's designed like GED, it's gonna be delivered like GED, but they actually haven't released it yet. So they're not looking till September, October to actually have that program up and running, but that's gonna be a huge gap in our community for that, especially when it comes to getting into either post-secondary or any type of employment. So we are working with the ministry to figure out what the solution is. Um, we are bringing adult learning into the Great Opportunity Building, so we're working with GILA to look at how we can do alternative high school programming, which will offer dual high school college courses to also help earn your Ontario Secondary Diploma. Um, but this would not be the first solution for GED, because if you have someone that comes to us with four high school credits, they're not going to do 26 booklets of PLAR assessments to get it completed. It would be far too long. 
We also are accredited through GILA to do your grade 11 math, your, a lot of your trades programming, because we find a lot of students that are coming to us wanting to get in a trade are lacking the math and sciences to actually get into unions. Um, the standard to get into some of the Ontario college programs is still a grade 10, but if you actually want to get into a union, you need your uh, math and physics. So there's a little bit of a disconnect there. We also have our building futures, which is welding training, robotic welding, pipe welding, level one assessments. We also have our welding supervisor levels and we're a welding level one certified test center. And we have our accreditation through the Canadian Welding Bureau. So we're actually accreditation and test center. So right now we're working with the mill rights out of Hamilton and they test and they do uh, training with us Monday to Thursday um, in the evenings. We also have training programs like Steps to Success, which is more of your employment readiness. We are also certified for safety training, construction and safety, computers for every day, business plan training. We offer programs like Mastering Your Skills, so office administration, bookkeeping, automotive basics, construction and healthcare office assistant. And then we can also develop professional development training, so like customer service training, trades entrance exams, preps human resource training. And the one unique thing about OSTTC is that we can specifically design specialized curriculum that meets the needs of employers or agencies. And we work with you to ensure it's exactly what you want. So one of the things that we did do through the pandemic was we worked with uh, Six Nations Social Services and we ran the ECE program all virtually hybrid because of the demand to reopen up our daycare centers, but we didn't have the teachers. So we were able to partner with Fanshawe College and we ran an accelerated program. We had 20 participants in that program and that way we were doing direct hires through great, through Six Nations um, social services to get those vacancies filled immediately. So we are very responsive and we can work with the community and the needs within council to see what programming do we need to fill these vacancies because it's a huge demand. We also have cultural components to a lot of our training. Um, we do different things like uh, develop. So we have some, we've been offering evening programs for language. We are facilitating the Oneida language course. Uh, we also are getting basic root theories and uh, methodologies into our introductory setting and that lead into conversational speaking. So we are, embedding this in all the work that we do now because we see the need, especially when it comes to students and the demand for training. Other things is we've been running some short-term courses and workshops. So we are fully certified as construction safety training. We've been doing other things like paddling training. Uh, through COVID, we realized the demand in tourism. Um, so we actually work with Six Nations Tourism and we are certified to do all their paddling and canoeing. We're doing smaller workshops just for self-care within the community as well, whether it's corn braiding, ribbon skirt making, um, and then first aid CPR. So that'd be the next slide. Sorry. Um, and we're offering that on weekends, evenings, things that would help community members that are working full time too, so that they could attend the programs. We're also looking at short-term courses and workshops. So this summer we ran a lot of summer camps. What we wanted to do was bring students in and get them thinking about careers. We ran Mind Over Metal Camp. It was very successful. It was in partnership with CWB Foundation and it was free for kids the ages of 12 to 15. We had a, it was an excellent uh, program and they've already asked to launch two more programs this summer. Um, but it was good exposure because a lot of our youth don't even know the careers that are available out there. So we want to give them that exposure at a young age. Our next is what we looked at here is I just brought some fiscal numbers. So we registered and our numbers have been low since COVID, but we ran nine full-time in-house programs and two full-time accredited programming through partnerships. We registered 193 students. Um, we also had 34 participants through our youth camps workshops. During fiscal, uh, we offered 10 full-time in-house programs, two full-time accredited. Um, and it's just, we had 117 registered to do this. So 
we are getting successful candidates. And what we're doing is now we're trying to link that directly into employment. So we're even looking at enhancing our training to say, okay, let's have the training component. Not only that, but get the workplace and hiring component added onto that. And even look how we can work with council to see how can we even stream it into your employment vacancies. The other thing was, uh, we do know the longhouse uh, did burn down. So we're working on a project now. We're looking at a design project possibly where we develop a construction program to look at how we can rebuild the longhouse. Uh, so maybe this fall or summer is one of our deadlines and our anticipation for running a program and actually teaching our youth how to build a longhouse. It's still in the making. But this is what the areas that we're looking at, and we can do a lot of cultural based training with that, but not only that, building the skills that they need. Um, but when the longhouse was up and running, we it was used as a facility for our classrooms. It was education for local ecology. We did natural and cultural history within the Grand River. It was historical, so we partnered with Six Nations Tourism. We work with the Development Corp as well, so we have a lot of different partnerships. It was used for cultural consultation, workshops and information, um, curriculum development, and a lot of organizations used it to host meetings and their public speaking. So next is our next business division, which is Guyana Say. So at Guyana Say, it, was, it operated since 2007. It was established in, to work in partnership with the city of Hamilton. So it was a project that we had with Two Rivers Community Development and the city of Hamilton and Great. And it was to perform ecological restoration after the construction of the Red Hill Valley project. Guyana Say is an ecological restoration and native plant and seed business. And it's dedicated to improving the health of Mother Earth using science-based approaches and traditional ecological knowledge. Next. Our experienced staff utilize specific and traditional methods to improve ecosystems. So it's usually through ecological restoration, invasive species management, and environmental outreach. Uh, we work closely with our clients to create an ecological sustainable environment for them all. And then we look at now the state of our environment, and I don't think it's news to everybody, but we are in a biodiversity crisis occurring globally and locally. Uh, the Carolinian zone is severely threatened and it's a forest type for Six Nations and we are the largest track in Canada. Species at risk over are, includes 125 different species in Canada. Canada's biodiversity targets is project is to protect 25% of our lands and oceans by 2025 while working towards 30% by 2023. Guyana Say can help locally to achieve these goals and the UN decade on ecological restoration is now. So it is a call to the world to prevent, halt and reserve the, you know, the degradation of ecosystems on every continent and every ocean. So the services we have to offer at Guyana Say, it's native seed plant collections. We do propagation and contract growing. We do invasive plant species management, urban habitat naturalization and native plant gardening, planting and direct seeding, large scale tree planting, wildlife habitat structure production, tree cutting and trimming, consulting services, tree inventories, plant inventories, and environmental outreach. Participation within the community. So we provide services, tree planting, invasive species management. We've done greenhouse sales, uh, medicinal plant supplies, outreach and education, tourism at Ghana Say. We have various partnerships with Six Nations Tourism, Wildlife Office, Public Works, Health, Chiefswood Park, Ontario Works. And then we work with all the different organizations within the community for social media and marketing. Participation beyond Six Nations. So we provide ecological restoration services, native plant and seed supply. We do outreach and education, conferences, the Southern Ontario Seed Strategy, Ontario Native Plant Growers Association. We're Carolinia Canada, Canada Coalition. So focal species and native plant economy working groups. We have the World Wildlife Fund and Forest Ontario. 
Um, these are our upcoming eco projects within Six Nations. So we have the Sloat site on growing restor going restorations, Forest Ontario tree subsidy. So we're looking at two candidate properties for representing over 2,000 seedlings. Isle Thomas, we work with them, Six Nations Tourism, so the Sugar Bush. Um, other organizations that we've been working with is the Winter Tree Identification. We're also doing the hosting of Six Nations Wildlife Turtle Nest Monitoring and Rescue Recovery. And the Indigenous Environmental Symposium Planting hosting in Six Nations in partnership with the Carolinia Canada. One of the things we face is the industry demand versus the supply is an ongoing opportunity for a greenhouse to grow. So the demand for readily available native plant and seed is at an all-time high. Growing contracts and demand for greenhouse services is increasing. The native plant gardening and ecological restoration is increasing. Greenhouse operations and seed services are growing to meet demand. Current nurseries and seed suppliers cannot meet the demand for the industry. And one of the things that we found out over COVID was the ministry actually shut down their native seed supplier through COVID. So now we have the demand for trying to grow all of these different types of trees and there's no stock. So large restoration projects are being postponed because there's lack of stock for trees. Working with industry partners is how to increase supply and demand, and that's what we're working towards. Um, so my, the last two parts of my presentation, so we have a couple more services that we do here at Gretty. So Gretty Financial Services is just a small business ownership and financial services ranging from payroll services, account payables, accounts receivable, financial statements, audits. And we currently are servicing seven clients and managing just over 12 million. This number fluctuates though based on funding and services required. Um, and the last part is our Gretty Rentals. So we do have rental properties in the community and we rent to members, organizations and surrounding agencies with the opportunity to host your meetings or events. We have boardroom space rental, theater, atrium, yurts, classroom rentals, and we're open seven days a week. Um, the reason why I wanted to come today too for the orientation was to look at, I guess, what our next steps could be. So Gretty, we ha currently have 62 staff, and these are all the different areas within the divisions that we work. Um, one of the things that I would be looking for from council is how we can work together because we're gonna need huge advocacy when it comes to like federal and provincial, uh, even assistance when it comes with like AFN and CU, our MPs, our MPP. We're looking at how council can assist us or direct us in how to recognize and support the programs and services Gretty has to offer in the community. We wanna do collaboration. So work with each other to increase community members opportunities. I know in the past, we worked with Six Nations um, HR because what would happen is if Six Nations HR department was doing hiring and you had unsuccessful candidates, the unsuccessful candidates would have been referred back to great and we would have worked with those candidates, especially community members to look at how we could help them and assist them with employment if they weren't successful. The other thing that we would like to work with in council is looking at what your hiring needs are within the departments. We also would like to look at services inventory, and I know Phil could probably speak to this, is we're trying to collect information when it comes to what the employment needs are, what are our services requirements within our community, especially with the land claim. Um, and what that looks like if our community is to take care of ourselves. We also look at employment data. One of the things that we're working on at GREAT is coming up with employment data, especially when it comes to the new ISETS agreement being renewed in 2029. We know that we're underfunded, but to actually come up with what our ask is gonna be, we have a lot of work to do to know, okay, how much more money do we require and what is that gonna look like for improvement? Uh, we went to, Toronto and met with the chiefs of Ontario and the things that different things that we talk about is the increase in population and then you look at when it comes to the
the increase in cost of living is wages increases, uh, the demand with employers are increasing. So we're outbidding each other for employment opportunities. I mean, administrative positions now are going for $70,000. And I know a lot of local employers cannot afford the wages. So we're kind of stealing from each other within our own community. And the other thing that we look at is, I don't know if these conversations have come up with duplication of services. So we're all getting guilty of grasping at money that may not be what we're experts at, but rather than doing referrals. Um, the other thing we wanna look at is the training um, requirements within the departments and how OSTTC can assist you with that training. And maybe the fact that you cannot lose a staff member full time, but maybe if we could look at hybrid training or part time training to get employees the training that they require even to move up in different divisions and take on those higher positions. I know that we need assistance also when it comes to advocating for capital projects within Gretty. I'm not sure where it's at yet in regards to capital projects, but I know funding is very difficult for federal or provincial because it comes down to jurisdiction, the land, and they don't fund capital. But of course our organizations need capital dollars to expand because when you look at the services, they want us to either increase enrollment or increase our intake, but it's difficult to do if we don't have the room or the people to build those resources. Um, other things is infrastructure projects. So I'm not sure if the Six Nations could Council could also either involve us or include us in these bids. So allow us an opportunity for employment and training initiatives when it comes to any sort of big projects and opportunities for our people. Um, access for Ghana say to bid on projects related to on and off reserve development. And then these are all just my questions, so you don't have to answer today. But even Six Nations Council stewardship. So when it comes to Mother Earth, like what is Council's role and in involvement? Ghana say can offer inventory counts in the community to improve accuracy and quality of data, invasive species removal, you know, restoration services. I just think we have a huge opportunity right now, and Gretty would like to look at an opportunity to work within council to see how we can work together on, you know, creating new opportunities for either in our departments or our community. So that's why I'm here today. That's a lot. <laughs> yes, it is a lot. And thank you, Erin. Um, great work. And thank you for the information for us, but also for the for the community, because it's a lot. It is. And it's a lot that you offer for the community at all levels. And I think what we're looking for, even from a board level and staff level, is even what committees would be useful for us to sit on, where we could be able to collaborate because I feel like since COVID, we've kind of, you know, we've all been off track, I guess, and where we can assist. Oh, for sure. And that's what uh, me and Nathan were just talking about. So we'll set up a meeting with okay. me and Nathan and we'll discuss all what you're, what you brought up. Okay. Thank Sound you. Good? <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, any comments or questions? I have Greg. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. Um, that was a good presentation to the, um, one of the things I like to see that um, you're getting the longhouse be rebuilt, hopefully this uh, this summer. Summer, yeah. I know that's been a big uh, both education and also a tourist attraction as well. The um, in uh, having a short uh, chance for me and, and a short stay on council is that to work with tourism now that we're trying to combine, you know, the Guyana say with also all our other tourism sites. Yes. Like including woodland, yep. including also the. Um, uh, in front of Pauline Johnson, as you know, you take care of that, mm -hmm. uh, the frontage there as well. And we're looking to see if we could combine it and get a very good tourism package. As you know, this year we did have a chance to visit in three different regions from Niagara Falls, Niagara region and St. Catharines. And they all seem to be very interested in, mm -hmm. in um, getting uh, the availability of a tourism package here. And then of course, one of your sites will be a strong draw. So I really uh, um, commend you on, on all your work. So that, that's really good. It looks very positive. Yeah, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Go ahead, Helen. I was the first employee hired by Greg. Yay. 
back in 19, end of 1992, did the Jobs Ontario program. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, there, I guess there's going to be an issue coming up. I don't know if anybody's really talked about too much about it with Ontario's um, changing their employment services. Yes. So that'd um, be the, uh, they're switching to SMS now, so yeah. Employment Ontario. So one of the things that we've done through GREAT is we did deliver the Employment Ontario Agreement. So we had like COJG and all the different types of funding. Bill is here as a board member. We are not, so we actually took a stance. We're not renewing our Employment Ontario Agreement for 24-25. And when we did that, it actually brought Employment Ontario to the table now. And the reason we stopped delivering it was because the funding we were receiving was definitely inadequate. And we actually made Employment Ontario look successful because we were meeting our stats. But the only way we were meeting our stats was we were finding funding from everywhere else to run their programming. And it, when I reviewed it with the board, I said, the, the, even with the increase in wage, so Employment Ontario decides our wages when uh, minimum wage increased. We did not even get an increase, even though minimum wage went up, their rate for wages stayed the same. So we had to find subsidies and other funding to actually bring minimum wage to the standard requirement that's required under Ontario, which to me makes no sense. I mean, if they're upping minimum wage, they should be increasing their funding. There was no increase. And the other thing is the way we meet our targets is based on the more barriered your client is, is how you actually reach your target. So you think with more, with the, the variety of barriers, they expect you to service somebody, there would be more funding attached to it. That's not what was happening. So we took a stand and it is a little bit of a risk. We're not ending our relationship with the province at all. But now what that has done is they've actually come back to the table and we had written letters in the past saying, you know, this program isn't working for our community. I asked the question, did you, have you actually done any dialogue with Six Nations? The answer was no. You know, so this program was de designed for Employment Ontario, like municipalities, but to be delivered on First Nations. So they said no. Um, so we, we didn't renew our agreement. But now they're coming to us saying, let's run a pilot project. So, and I knew it was a risk we were going to take by saying no, but I knew we could find, I was confident we can find other money, other grant dollars to do the work Employment Ontario was doing. So it doesn't mean we weren't going to be able to service the same amount of people. We would actually be able to service, I think, more people and provide a better service with other funding than what we were receiving. So this is an opportunity for us now to come back and say, this is what we want. So we're just in those stages now. So that's, I know that is an issue. I did go to the meeting in Toronto a couple of weeks ago. That was part of Chiefs of Ontario too, as the Employment Ontario, because I know Ontario Works is going through this, right? Can you use your mic? Thanks. It'll be an issue for Ontario Works for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we're, and they're trying to push this one model fits everybody. Yeah. And I, I've been sitting at the table, really speaking up for Six Nations. And, um, but I'm glad you guys are doing this because you're bringing more into it. And I keep telling them Six Nations is different. We're different. We have a thing that's working really well because we have great and we have Ontario Works doing all of their pre-employment stuff and everything's working good. We don't need somebody to come and shove some kind of model down our throats. And Well, and I know the one SMM for that's delivering the employment and training, they're out of the States that have the contract. Yeah, they're called an international company from somewhere. Yeah, so they're international organizations that would be administering the funding. Yeah. So, so that's going to be huge, though, for Ontario Works. And now, and they have a tripartite table set up, mm -hmm. but we're not represented on there. Or, well, it's it's a complicated because mm -hmm. Steve sits there, so they say Six Nations is in there, and I know Greg is supposed to be sitting there, so they say Greg is there, but they're not there to represent Six Nations. Steve's there to represent the 
uh, Al Feds and Greg is there as part of a Chiefs of Ontario's economic development. Mm -hmm. We don't have a Six Nations person sitting there to represent us. And I've been trying to get somebody on there, but they keep saying Six Nations has two people sitting there. Yeah. And I know that was part of my, just at the very end when I asked, like, that's what we would like to know is who are the representatives that we would need to work with, especially when it comes to like OSTTC right now is going through our WinHEC accreditation and IASC, right? And there's been a lot of communication and new letters going out about post-secondary received like $3.1 million, but Indigenous institutes didn't get anything. We still get the one-year pilot projects, you know? So we don't get mainstream funding, even though we're a third pillar. But we even threw out, look at the French model. French colleges get full mainstream dollars under the same idea of retaining our culture and language. But Indigenous institutes have been recognized through legislation, and we don't receive mainstream dollars. We're still writing work plans and proposals every year for wage subsidy and some core funding. So... That's where I'm at, where I would like to work with council to find out who sits on KU, who sits on AFN, and who I need to work with to advocate, for sure. Cynthia? Sorry. Well, I touched somewhat on what my question was. I know Sandy Porter was here and giving us a presentation about the concerns about the, um, what is it called? The new employment services. My employment services. And that was his concern He's, because one size doesn't fit all. Remember no. the old standard. And if, if his clients, because of all the barriers they have, uh, he works with, I thought, addressing the barriers. Yep. But yours does too, but making them, maybe the difference being. There is a difference. Rate. So what we do, so I'm actually going to be working with Sandy. We're, one thing that I've been doing is outreach with each department and look at how we can collaborate because we only get a set amount of money. So there may be things Ontario Works can do. Okay, if that's eligible under your funding, this is what we can do. And let's work together to match that, right? Not start, you know, fighting over no. clients or anything like that, no. but actually share the caseloads mm -hmm. and how we can pool together to be more successful. Mm -hmm. You got a pilot project now? Well, that's what they're calling it, but nothing has moved from the, the at least the interest is there and they're they they are willing to come back and say, okay, let's do a pilot project. Would they have any appetite given how different we all and we are of doing it in collaboration with our Ontario works? We could ask. I mean, and that would be maybe when you're meeting with Sandy discuss or you're talking about the two using your resources together. Mm-hmm. It would seem. Yep. Yeah, he was expressing the same sorts yep. of concerns. Yep. And I know from our board level, we have no issue working with any organization in the community. We're, we have the same mandate, right? Help our people. For sure. Any other questions, uh, Dale? Yeah, thank you. Good presentation, Aaron. I see Thanks. <laughs> great or ready has grown in leaps and bounds over the years and expanded in their service, what they do for the community. But I guess my only comment is, is, Chief, when you have this meeting, I, I'm not sure which committee they're going to be reporting to that other committee members get be included in that meeting for your, for your discussion. That's um, something that um, me and Nathan will discuss, but I'm looking probably at um, community. Mm -hmm. Okay. Melba? Melba, can you use your mic? Melba, Melba, can you grab, thank you. I've made all these mistakes. Did you hear me, Erin? I could hear you. Okay, yeah. I've often um, noticed uh, customer service that it's not adequate. It's it's not uh, as well as it should be throughout departments and in the general community. So people often have their skills concerning education and training, but not as how we relate to other people. Mm -hmm. especially when it's a difficult situation. So I would hope that uh, our our council would take advantage of your customer service because I've heard of uh, such as your relative there who, I guess, I think it was a Toronto bank or whatever, Bank of Toronto or whatever, had great customer service. 
and you can see the differences when people have the training, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to handling difficult people with their behaviors and their language. So how do you do that, you know? Yeah, we source out some specialized training and we work with the, either it's the employer or whoever's requesting the training. Um, and we look at accredited different bodies and there's a lot of specialized Indigenous organizations that work with communities that have this kind of training. Yeah. So we bring the experts in and we do a lot of coordination to deliver it. Yes. And sometimes council too could yep. probably use that because we deal with some mm -hmm. of the same people mm -hmm. and the behaviors and the language. I mean, I've seen it around here. So yep. and so was doing, saying this word and that word yep. and, you know, and how do you handle that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you handle it in a respectful way? Thanks. Yep. Dale, then Carrie. Aaron, just a question, and, and I've talked to like various people as it relates to younger people, mm -hmm. and I know technology has changed and advanced, and I know one is the biggest issue they've always talked about is, you know, hiring uh, some of the younger generation, and the issue they have is with their phones, and I, I've talked to a contractor, and he was, uh, he had a, had his nephew working for him, but he ended up, he had to terminate his employment because every time he turned around, he would be on his phone texting and not doing his work, so is that some some knowledge that you share with kids and educating them in relation to like workplace work habits or being on site and working, especially for safety reasons. If they're busy on their phone, something could happen. So we do, I we do. And we've seen a lot of this, especially since COVID. Um, and it's been a, a really big thing, even with, there's been a definite switch employer versus employee for now. I don't know if any of, if it's ever come to council or not, but it's very challenging to be an employer nowadays, um, especially with cell phone technology, COVID, um, the demand for, even within our organization, we aren't hybrid. We realized, we obviously had to do hybrid through some of the COVID, but a lot of our clients like to be able to come in and see that person, right? We still like that one-on-one -on -one meetings and human contact. Um, so it's been a, a difficult switch for sure. We do provide that. Um, it's a struggle though, Dale, I'm not gonna, you know, it's, it's there. We just do a lot of, and the, we also work with the employers and say, though, you have to be upfront, you know, you have to, you know, you have to tell them and set your boundaries. But yeah, I mean, there is a lot of turnover right now, but a lot of turnover also is due to the fact that it's so competitive now employees actually have the advantage because they can jump from job to job because employers are desperate to fill these positions. They lost a lot of people over COVID and a lot of people that were working in certain industries over COVID, especially health, because of COVID exited and went to places like Amazon, you know, nurses, PSWs, you know, they're like, nope, I'm out of here. I'm doing this. So, uh, you know, a lot of people that had a lot of mental health impacted through COVID have definitely switched careers. So we're trying to backfill those positions and that's difficult. Um, Carrie, Carrie and Hazel. Oh, then Hazel. It's, you had a good report. Thank you. Uh, my question is not about your program. It's about uh, Saturday Kone, the lunch count. Mm -hmm. It's closed up? Yes, it has. We, uh, Great is gonna get out, got out of the, or Greddy, sorry, got out of the food service business. So what we're gonna do now is we're just going through our renovations and we're gonna open it up to community if they would like to come in and lease the space. So that'll be a few weeks yet before we get that advertisement out to the community and we're gonna open it up. So it will still be a food service industry. It's just not something Greddy is going to take on. Um, Hazel, then Amos, and then we'll wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like this. Uh, Aaron, I was wondering if you'd elaborate on the issue of uh, the summer student pay rate when the uh, council established the standard of living amount for all employees, and then that was um, sort of directed that the summer students had to be paid in accordance with that standard rate and um, the problems that it caused for grades. Yeah, it was so when the summer student, I know that did come back to us um, when the increase happened over here, I guess, through council, 
We did see a lack of applicants applying for the summer jobs through employment because we weren't able to increase to that rate. So we lost a lot of potential candidates and employers in regards to we couldn't, the funding, we didn't have the funding to top up. So we had to leave minimum wage at the rate that it was set up for summer students. So it was it was difficult to navigate at the start, but then after you have students that are looking for work. Um, but no, we weren't able to match what council's rates were for minimum wage for summer students, for sure. And I don't know if that's something that's going to continue or, okay. So it's not. I just want to comment on that topic, Sherry, because mm -hmm. that standard rate of pay was for the council, Six Nations Council employees only. And I know the way that the former CEO administered it. He said that everybody had to pay summer students that same 40 grand per year rate and that wasn't how it was supposed to go. Summer student rates are applicable from the uh, minimum wage rate that the province sets. I don't know why he did that because that was not the right thing to do with that. Thank you. And again, Nathan's looking into that. Um, Amos? Thank you very much. Um, very good report. Aaron, I just wanted to know, if I asked you what the unemployment rate is here, can you tell me? No, I can't. That's why, well, that's the reason why we're here, right? We want to work together. I know. Since I got here, I've been asking, what is the demographic of this community? Mm -hmm. If we're going to be doing any social planning, we've got to know that. Exactly. And that's and been on, and reasons. Phil has brought that to our board many times yeah. is, I don't know how we come together or work together, but that's definitely on our work plan is yeah. we need to find that out. And it would have to be some sort of collaboration in regards to a feasibility study, because I even know with our ISET funding, it's not employer driven, it's client driven. So we have to be very careful, right? So whether we go after new proposals, but definitely it would have to be, I don't know what that answer is. And I know we've asked Sandy the same thing at Ontario Works. Yeah, we I don't have the definite data for that. Yeah, I think we've got Zach and his team working on Lots of data now, so which is going to be great for us. Yep. If we're going to do any kind of social planning in this community. Yes. Especially in the next four years that I'm here. But anyway, I'm going to be asking those questions of mm -hmm. all the departments and all the agencies because we got to know that in order to do any social planning. Yep. And then I'm also going to, I think I would, I just was told, voluntold that I'm the chair of health. So oh, good. I'm going to be quick. I'm going to be asking these tough questions because I, we need to know where we our status as a healthy community. Mm -hmm. How vibrant is it, mm -hmm. right? Or what's the potential of it becoming vibrant? What are we gonna do in place? What are the challenges? Um, I know one thing that I've been doing is I've been working with post-secondary because even to try and help employers, I've been asking post-secondary and we had you know a great working relationship with them is we're trying to get an idea of who's, new who's newly graduating and in what areas are they graduating in and is there potential that we can attract them back to the community mm -hmm. to work for us because they're working off reserve and an example is my own daughter's graduating from paramedic and she's taking a job in hamilton mm -hmm. you know and i'm like what are you doing <laughs> you know but you can't afford them yeah yes right anyway yeah so i want to begin that discussion with the health group that i'm going to be mm -hmm. working with um, I think we need to amend and adopt the, our own Haudenosaunee social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of conversation I want to have with, with, with this committee, that I'm, this portfolio that I'm with, because we can't get anywhere unless we're just spinning our wheels and we're accepting what some civil servant in Toronto has designed for us or in Gatineau, Ottawa. Mm -hmm. We have to be the architects of our destiny, not some white civil servant mm -hmm. or Indian, East Indian civil servant in Toronto on Bay Street. Well, it used to be St. Clair, yep. Gatineau, and Ottawa. Yep. We got to be the architects of that and start that. That's my message next week at the Chiefs of Ontario. I get to say something to them finally, but from my perspective, and that's what the message is going to be, the social determinants of health to include Indigenous spirituality and languages. Mm -hmm. 
if that's the whole thing of who we are, that's the, my message next week. Mm -hmm. Plus, adopting and adapting and creating a new Canadian index of well-being, but call it the Haudenosaunee index of well-being. Mm -hmm. It's already there. We just need to amend it. And the thing is, it's by Waterloo University. It wasn't government driven. So we can look at that as part of our social planning in this community, mm -hmm. our political planning, our educational planning, all those domains and, and in interventions are all there. All we got to do is adopt it in our planning. So that's what I want to bring to the table. And then, I, you know, I, I can't wait to hear what you and uh, Sandy come up with, because I asked Sandy whether he talked great. Because like, I, I hear I hear all these all these presentations we've had in the last three months, different pockets of money. Yeah, I and don't know how we're not we're not. I I each totally other. agree. I yes. mean, and you know we're under resourced as well. So I would rather like I'd rather do a referral, mm -hmm. right? And right. let whoever is good in that area to have access to that funding. Right. Back in the day, if I received a grant opportunity from an organization like the ministry i'd forward it to polytech or forward it over to somebody else and say here's an opportunity for you right mm -hmm. like this is not in our area but now i think because the funding hasn't changed look at isets is going to renew in 2029 i'm asking now let's be part of this conversation and how did they even determine six nations amount i still haven't been able to get an answer from our rep on how they determine the amount for six nations because it hasn't changed, you know, right. and our population has definitely increased right. and the cost of living has gone up wages. So I don't want to get us in a predicament in 2029 that it stayed the same. Right. I didn't mean that. That's a, <laughs> as a pun. <laughs> Excuse the pun. Yeah. I just want to, um, one of my aspirations about joining council is to look at a community credit union. Mm. So I think you might want to put that in the back. Like, how do we get the staffing to manage a community credit union, right? And especially if we get the land claim, I think we can negotiate yeah. to have that right here with our own treasury, right? So I think we need to have great, start thinking about that. Yeah, well, and I know Phil had brought to the board about trying to hire a consultant or somebody to do, I don't want to put you on the spot, Phil, but it was like the services that we need, right? And what's required in our own community. Yeah. I guess. Can do you want to come to the mic yeah, so everybody can hear you? <laughs> I, guess, I guess one of the things, and I'm glad all the questions coming out. We've got to build capacity, and what's that going to look like? I know I did a good exercise working with Audrey on trying to with the lifelong learning and what our needs would be. Oh, <laughs> I'm not going to be here that long. <laughs> But like people aren't lining up looking for jobs. Those days it's changed. So what we have linking in with post-secondary, linking in with what 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 are your department's expertise? What are they going to be like? What are they going to? What kind of people do we need to fill these positions? Because if we're going to be strong and self-governing and the way we want to do it, we've got to start this homework now. Actually, we should have started it years ago. But that we've got to get on that. I think. Our lawyers have brought you up to date on be ready. So this all fits together. And I, I've got to put Audrey and say uh, she stuck her neck out and took a lot of a beating about trying to get the lifelong learning orchestrated. That's a good template because that's how we're trying to design and pull all the various departments together. And I really hope what you brought up, and this is excellent. Those are the type of things that we need. So trying to get great to do this. Everybody's in their little silo and nobody wants to share, but it's, it's coming down bit by bit. So kudos to this council, wish you well. And I think we can do it. I know we can do it. So that's, that's all my only comments. My, Follow up. My last comment is just that I'm being here for three months now. Like I asked some of the directors and I said, do you guys ever meet like every quarter or every half year? They said, no. So that's what we have to encourage our, you know, our our high level directors to sit to, together and do the social planning with us yeah. to get us going. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for your report. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Again, thank you for coming in, Aaron, Phil.
<laughs> and we'll get something set up with you. Thank you. Okay. Have a great night. Can I have a mover to accept his information? Moved by Dale, second by Audrey. All in favor? Anybody opposed? Seat on carried. Number six, adoptions of general council minutes uh, for February 27th. Is there a mover? Moved by Elena, seconder. Second by Carrie, all in favor? Anybody opposed? See none, carried. Number seven, any counselors with reports? If not, okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, I know I wouldn't know we weren't, I guess everybody was invited to go to the uh, COVID uh, conference they had on Saturday at the community hall. It was well done um, with um, Deb and um, Zach taking the lead. I, I know, I don't know who the, all their colleagues were, but the community that came were really involved. I liked what they did. The tricks they did was they had everybody put in tickets and there was draws throughout the whole thing. So you didn't have that after half an hour eating and then everybody leaves. Their people were in, in, in engaged right to the end because they had a chance to win. You know, what a great way to do that. So anyway, I commend them on that. It was a, a good report. I think they're gonna circulate it. It's online and stuff. Um, but I thought maybe um, with the health committee or the health portfolio, we'd have, we'd have them present. And that's all their findings through COVID, post COVID and everything that they're doing. And they're gonna start another one now. Um, I don't forget what's called, who didn't know, Shoni check-in, I think. Something like that, that they're going to start up uh, launching in a few, few weeks for all of us to be involved. I know we don't do a census here, but this is the way they're gonna try and, they're not calling it a census, they're calling it, a, uh, well, a check-in. I think it's a good way to do that. And then uh, it's, 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 it's non-threatening, right? So I like the way they're, what that staff is doing, and I wish I could know, know all their names, but I know Zach and Deb were there uh, presenting. It was, it was a great, great presentation. I know it was open to everybody, so anyway. Zach sent me an, e an email uh, the night before. He says, you're always talking about demographics, come to this. So I did, so it was great. Just wanted to say that much. So. Good. Thank you. Okay, um, there's none. I don't have any updates. Number nine, scheduling. Tell us placekeeping event. Placekeeping event aims to recognize the first indigenous floor for the TELUS Harbor flagship office. I'm unable to attend. Is there anybody that wants to attend um, next Wednesday, March 27th, from 12.30 to 1.30 in Toronto? Yeah. Okay. So the health is there. Um, there's a health um, conference. So Leslie said she can um, stop over there. Um, it says right in here, in your, yep, in your letter. Yep, this is, um, it passed. And they just said we can respond. Yep. Oh, to the 21st, okay. So is there anyone that wants to um, go for the 27th to the um, TELUS placekeeping event? Leslie, can I have a mover that Leslie attends the um, placekeeping event to take place on Wednesday, March 27th, 2024, from 12 to 1.30 at 25 York Street, Toronto. Moved by Cynthia, second by Amos. All in favor? Anybody opposed? Seeing none, carried. Um, the Six Nations of the Grand River Council appoint um, myself and a delegate to attend the upcoming Iroquois Caucus General um, Assembly to be held in Oneida, on March 27th to the 28th. Um, Cynthia, to go. So me and Cynthia is moving. Um, it's just one, one for this one. Yeah, I guess just one. <laughs> we'll keep you on. Well, I'm interested <laughs> next time. Next time, <laughs> yeah, we'll go down the list. <laughs> um, is there a mover for myself and Cynthia to attend the Iroquois Caucus? Moved by Amos, second by Audrey. All in favor? Anybody opposed? Seen on carried. Um, question, Elena? 
Just about Iroquois Caucus, I was saying to Melba, because there is a lot of interest in, in going to Iroquois Caucus, and just to be mindful of the agenda. So if there's anybody, any agenda items that, um, that relate to committees, that those committee members maybe take priority. Thanks. Recommend, oh, Melba? Uh, Elena also pointed out that it's in Oneida this time, very close by, and it was mentioned that if people wish to attend another meeting that's not in their portfolio, then that may happen. Yeah, again, of course, and I agree with that. What's on the agenda? Yeah, then, then you have an interest to go. Thanks. Um, Helen? I think if people have an interest to go to a meeting, they should be able to go. It doesn't matter what committee is it on. That's my thinking. There's a lot of issues that I have an interest in that I may not be sitting on that committee. Like I'm running into an issue with this employment. Somebody's going to have to take my place on an employment working group because I don't sit on the committee that employment's going to fall under. We were told if we didn't sit on, if we were sitting on committees that didn't apply to the committee we sit on, that somebody else has to go. So wherever employment is going to fit, that's who would be sitting on an employment working group that I've been sitting on. Because that's what we were told by Amy. So, but if there's an Iroquois caucus meeting or some other kind of meeting and someone's got interest in going, I don't see any reason why people can't go, whether they're sitting on a committee or not sitting on a committee. The committees were never, in my understanding, intended to control what we do as council, or it shouldn't be. I have Greg, Elena, Cynthia, the name of. Uh, yeah, just in, with respect to the employment committee there, Chiefs of Ontario, I was only asked to sit in on one meeting with when the chief, I think Chief Mark Mark was on it at that time, and and since that time I have not have not been on that. Um, the other thing too is yeah, being close to Anita, uh, I know there have been various issues that we've been following, including the, um, you know, the J Treaty Border Alliance, and also um, the MET issue, as well as the harvesting group that's been formed i know mark was on that and there be they'll be looking for a replacement i believe for um, for mark on the iroquois caucus um i have some interest in that i i can go i don't i don't need any hotel if you can drive there and back and forth but it's not a big deal but but yeah but if those like you're saying if those have a specific interest then um they should be allowed to go alina I think Iroquois caucus probably falls under that BCR Dale. You can probably say so if it's, it's it's one one member, one council member can go, chief and one council member. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Nathan. Um, oh. And it, oh, Nathan will. Yeah, there is a motion um, that uh, stipulates there's uh, two individuals that can go to those meetings, with the exception of Kune. Then. Okay. I think we also need to be mindful of the the expense to Iroquois caucus because the communities um, put in very little money. So I think each community is ten ten thousand dollars. So I mean, if all twelve of us all of a sudden had an interest in going, um, we're kind of outdoing all of the other communities, and maybe we should be putting in more for. For those costs, I get this one is is very close by, but I think it's something that we should be mindful of. Cynthia, Amos, and Helen. Okay, I was just gonna Helen. You were, I was just looking at these little charts we got here. Community and the, under there, it's got that um, Grand River Employment and Training. So that and your name's in there. So that that would be you, huh? Oh, this must be an older one then. Sorry about that. But I, I thought, like, and these haven't been finalized. And I don't think we should assign to Amy, the, the lurk, workings here, because she continued to repeat it. This is yours. So what council wishes. And 
the last wish I heard out of council, we haven't got the newest one was though, like, and there's a, there's a rationale, remember, because these things flow through to these, there's a relationship. So it, there is a rhyme and a reason how she put it together, which was great. It helps clear, like, okay, that relates to this, but this hasn't been finalized yet. And the last wish I heard, probably not captured on this one, wasn't the very last one, is that um, we would all, somebody said over there, I understood it, if we had a wish to go to any of these particular ones that you are interested in, you you would go. I guess it would be if you have time to go, is because we're all so busy. But that that's what I understood. But for sure, those who are listed over there, we, we should be making every effort to go. And on this one, the Iroquois Caucus, that is under that unity building and external. So this is how I understood it is we should, if possible, be going to those. But I also understood if others have a desire to, you have the time to then. So we might have to look at, I know we got a little rule book going there. We might have to look at our, our rule book book. And and I don't know what our what our budget's like. That that's I'm always worried about the the purse here. That's my only caution. Amos, then Helen. Yes, I'm just wondering: is the agenda out for this caucus meeting, or can we have it on PL next week? The PL meeting. Okay, bring it to PL next week. We, we can, can do look that. at it. We can send it out. Go ahead. Linda. Um, adoption of the agenda, introduction to the new coordinator, uh, review record of decisions, external relations, um, it says meeting with Blackfoot Confederacy, the working group updates uh, from the IC harvesting working group, and then there's item six is IC strategy, there's a terms of reference and a strategic plan, and item seven is financials. And item eight, next meeting date. So that's it. So that just that just came in at say four thirty this afternoon. Helen. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify what Linda was saying because the Iroquois caucus don't pay us. They're not paying us to go there. We pay ourselves to go there. Huh. And like Greg said, you can drive there back and forth. It's not going to cost. You don't have to have a hotel. You don't. You don't have to have food because they usually give you lunch. So it's not a big expense, especially when it's an Oneida. It would be different if it was an Aquasusney, then I would say just two people should be going because it's more expensive because it's so far to go. But it's only an Oneida. And I know a lot of the newer consuls probably would love to see what the Iroquois Caucus does. It feels good to sit down and meet with all of your different Mohawk peoples and different reserves and get to know each other and we got to quit being so such a stickler sometimes on things that we do and I, I don't know about any rules that says if you want to go go <laughs> Audrey um yes thank you uh, Sharon okay I think we're talking about two different things as well when we said we can go to any meeting, this is not a meeting with your caucus. It's in a general assembly for two days. So that there's a whole different, and we don't, I don't even know we have any rules on going to assemblies. Are we treating it the same as the AFN and the C uh, and CU? And if we are, then it's, then it's opened up. But if it's just our committee meetings here, then it's just, Go to another building and attend the meeting. The way the motion reads, it it is inclusive of meetings and assemblies and assemblies. Yeah. Because it, the exemption in that motion was for AFN, which they only run assemblies, as well as Chiefs of Ontario, and they only run assemblies. So it is inclusive of assemblies. Yes, go ahead, Audrey. Um, I think Amy did a good job setting this all up, but now it belongs to us. So let's, as a group, decide what we want to do. And um, 
I guess at the next meeting. No. Okay, let's move to 9-3. The Six Nations of the Grand River Council appoint a delegate um, from the Rights and Lands Resource Committee to attend the Iroquois Caucus Harvest Working Group uh, 14th and 15th in Tindanega. Any of you guys able to go? That's um, Thursday and Friday. Yes, Stu, it's a working group. I remember Michelle was Michelle was on there before. Michelle Bomberry. So if any if they're interested, um please let me know and um we can get you set up. And Tidanega, uh fourteenth to fifteenth this Thursday and Friday. But um, for now, um, until you um, is able to. Okay. Go ahead, Elena. Sorry. Um, on the rights and lands resources, that's where the hunting and harvesting falls. Cynthia Dale, Helen, Greg, Amos. That's what the recommendation says, a delegate from there. So if, if any of them, if any of you are able to go. And if not, Leslie is willing to, to go. Yeah, <laughs> go to the harvest group. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, so is there somebody who, is it okay if Leslie goes, if the ones on the committee are unable to go? Is that okay? Del has dentist. He already has uh, meetings, he said. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah, exactly. So um, is Trevor going? Um, Trevor's going. So um, if um, a counselor is not able to go, at least Trevor's will be there. Okay. So can I have... Yep, go ahead, Cynthia. Oh, that's the Iroquois Caucus Harvesting Group. Is that like a subcommittee of the Iroquois Caucus? Yes. So what is it like? Seeds and but like harvesting, but fishing, hunting, yeah. Oh, harvesting. so harvest, harvesting, in yes. okay. I had yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so for nine three, um, Trevor Bomber will will attend, he's attending already. So, can I have wave second reading for nine one and nine two? Is there a mover moved by Elena, second by Amos? All in favor, anybody opposed? Seen and carried. Uh, okay, can I, not going, Trevor will be there, yeah. Okay, so I need a motion to adjourn, to go to the in-camera. Moved by Elena, second by Amos, all in favor? Anybody opposed? See none, carried. Thank you for joining us tonight and have a great night. <laughs>